Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dale Cristincio from FDA's Stakeholder Engagement Staff, and I'd like to welcome you all to the stakeholder call today to discuss the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. I'd like to start with a few housekeeping items. As attendees, you will all be muted, um, and you will not be able to unmute yourself unless you're selected to ask a question. Our stakeholder call will begin with the brief remarks uh, before the question and answer portion. To ask a question, please raise your hand via the participant panel in Zoom. You'll find the participant panel button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Stakeholders will be limited to one question, so we can ensure we get to as many questions as possible. If you're selected to ask a question, you'll be asked to unmute and to start your video if you would like. We'd love to see your faces. Your name and organization should be announced as well so we know who, um, where you're calling from. You may experience a brief pause before and after you ask your question, just be aware. Today we are joined this afternoon by Dr. Janet Woodcock, the Acting FDA Commissioner, and Dr. Peter Marks, the Director of FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. First, we'll hear remarks from Dr. Janet Woodcock and then Dr. Peter Marks. Following their remarks, we will open up for questions. With that, let's turn over the program to Dr. Woodcock. Thank you, Dale, and thank you all for joining us. As you all know, after an extensive review of the available data, the FDA and CDC lifted the recommended pause on the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. The pause was recommended due to a limited number of adverse events reported after the Janssen vaccine was administered. These events suggested a potential increase in the risk of blood clots, i.e. thrombosis, occurring alongside a low platelet count or thrombocytopenia. After a thorough review of all available data, the FDA and CDC concluded that the possibility of this so-called thrombosis thrombocytopenia syndrome occurring is very low, but the investigation into the level of potential vaccination related risk is still ongoing. For example, we wish to understand if we see more events, if there are certain subgroups that are uh, more at risk. Uh, together, both agencies have full confidence that this vaccine's known and potential benefits outweigh its known and potential risks in individuals 18 years of age and older. Um, <clears throat> as, as you know, um, there was increased risk of these, this so-called thrombos uh, uh, thrombosis thrombocytopenia syndrome in women between the age of 18 and 49. Uh, compared to other recipients. And so that um, information was added to the uh, fact sheets for both the healthcare uh, providers and the patients. Now, uh, putting um, this vaccine, uh, lifting the pause was not a decision we reached lightly. Uh, medical and scientific teams at both the FDA and CDC reviewed several sources of information and data uh, related to the vaccine to reach that assessment. We looked at uh, in reports, and I thank all of you who's, who help reporting to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System and looked at the available literature. We also talked to our global regulatory partners about this uh, syndrome uh, that has been reported with uh, the AZ vaccine in uh, in Europe particularly, which uses a virus from the adenovirus family has been modified to contain the gene uh, for, uh, for making a protein from SARS-CoV-2, very similar to uh, the Janssen vaccine. And we gained quite a bit of information from our global partners that we was somewhat related to the, the adverse events we're seeing in the United States. So considering all these factors, we're confident that the Janssen vaccine meets our robust standards for safety, effectiveness, and quality for a medical product that is used widely uh, and including in healthy individuals. So as I said, the uh, fact sheet has been updated as well as uh, for healthcare practitioners, as well as the fact sheet for recipients and caregivers to include information about the risk of the syndrome, uh, which is in uh, 
occurred in a very small number of people who've received this particular vaccine. Um, and we hope that you will have enough information for individuals who have questions about which vaccine is right for them uh, to discuss their options with them. Now, I'll, let me see if Dr. Marks has been able to join the call. Dr. Marks? Yes, I'm on, thanks. Great, much. I'll turn it over to you then, thank thanks. you. I think Dr. Woodcock covered it very nicely, but I, uh, the, I think the important things here are to remember that um, the, this is indeed a very rare complication. Um, the pause that we took allowed us to ensure that there weren't some undetermined number of cases that we weren't seeing. Uh, it allowed us, we did pick up a few more cases during that pause, um, but uh, it was not like a ton of them uh, came forward, which was very helpful. So this is on the same order of magnitude uh, that we were originally seeing, um, and that, that's important. Um, additionally, the pause allowed us to do something which I think is very, very important, which was to educate providers about this complication so that when somebody comes in uh, five or six days after uh, receiving the vaccine and complains of a severe headache, they know to check a platelet count to ensure uh, that uh, this syndrome isn't something uh, that is presenting, if that's something that might be suspected. And then if they see the syndrome is present, they know uh, what to actually do here, which is not to do what we normally do uh, when someone presents with a blood clot, um, uh, which is to give heparin, uh, but instead to use alternative anticoagulants and potentially consider the use of immune globulin, which seems to uh, really quiet down and uh, uh, treat this immune complication uh, leading to uh, a normalization in the platelet count uh, and a decrease in the risk of blood clots. So um, granted it's early days in the treatment, but uh, because we can uh, take some of the findings that have been seen with a related vaccine that's not available under emergency use authorization uh, at this time in the United States, the AstraZeneca vaccine, but it has been given uh, to uh, well over 35 million people in Europe, we can take that the treatment information from that and, and benefit from that here in the United States. So we did gain some, uh, and, and hopefully this will help reduce uh, the adverse effect. It may not prevent it from happening, but it we won't make it worse as physicians by uh, treating it inappropriately. So overall, the benefit risk, just to leave you, is still very favorable for this vaccine. As, as Dr. Woodcock noted, um, that I think we do have to note that in a, in a woman 18 to 49, she might want to think about uh, the options uh, that exist and the benefits and risks um, of uh, getting this vaccine immediately uh, versus potentially trying to wait for a two-dose vaccine and the, the, the complexity involved with getting a two-dose vaccine uh, in some cases may uh, still place the risk benefit in favor of getting this a vaccine. So I'll stop there and look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Marks and Dr. Woodcock. Um, I've asked everyone if they want to ask a question to raise their hand. That can be done from the participant panel at the bottom of your screen, but you can also type it into the chat box and I'll read it for you if you prefer to not appear on camera. I'll start with the first question, um, Dr. Marks. Can you talk a little bit about what FDA and CDC are doing to track this issue um, through the safety data and, and how we'll know um, in the future if, if additional problems are, are going to happen? So thanks. So I think the, the great news, I think about it, uh, this in the, the silver lining and the, and the bad news that this complication occurred is that I think we have a pretty good sense that our safety reporting systems are working the way they should be, uh, which is the vaccine adverse event reporting system collected these cases. Um, after um, we announced that these occurred, uh, we just saw additional cases come up that we would expect to have happened over the time interval because right, at, there were people at risk and they came up. So people were reporting these as they should be. So we have a passive system where people uh, report when they've had adverse events. And we have an active surveillance system where we go looking, in this case, for any one of 15 different 
uh, adverse events, both in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services databases, that's mostly people over age 65, and uh, in large healthcare claims databases and electronic healthcare records, uh, the Sentinel uh, BEST sy uh, system, which allows us to uh, look for uh, various issues as well. So we will continue to look very actively for these cases. CDC continues to pull these as they come in uh, through the vaccine adverse event reporting system. Uh, and we continue to look at each one of the cases uh, to see what we can learn uh, and we'll keep people updated. We'll also continue to look for other safety signals that might come up. Uh, and um, this was an opportunity, by the way, for us to look at um, the other vaccines. For instance, we looked at, uh, at the time, over 180 million doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that had been given and saw that either in the vaccine adverse event reporting system or in other uh, of the active surveillance systems, um, there were no reports of this uh, syndrome. So that was actually a good control uh, here. So we are, we'll continue to be very vigilant here. Um, and that, that, that we understand goes with the territory of this very large vaccine rollout. Great, thank you, Dr. Marks. The next question I have in the chat box is from Rita Carrion from Unidos US. Uh, Rita, Rita asks, besides age and gender, were there other demographic factors from the cases involved, such as race, race and ethnicity? Uh, it, a great question. Um, there were no uh, racial or ethnic features. And maybe since I might as well, uh, somebody I bet is going to ask the same question uh, and, and some other questions that are related to this. There was no clear relationship to taking any type of hormone replacement therapy or oral contraceptive pill. Uh, no clear relationship to underlying familial risk factors for having blood clots, such as uh, the factor V Leiden or prothrombin G mutation. So um, the major risk factor appeared to be um, uh, at this that we can identify at this time are, are being female between the ages of 18 and 49. Now there is additional work ongoing to see whether there might be an association with certain uh, immune uh, markers like HLA types um, uh, because there seems to be a, a more frequent occurrence of this in people in certain regions of Europe um, with the AstraZeneca vaccine than in other regions in Europe, but we still don't know that and that's something to be investigated. Great. Um, another question from Lucinda from the American Association of the Colleges of Pharmacy. She asks, Recent vaccine administration trends reflect a softening of demand for these vaccines in general. Do you believe this is attributable to some of these concerns or are we heading into the more hesitant populations at this point? This is uh, Dr. Woodcock. I think it's more likely we're heading into the hesitant population at this point. Um, uh, I think people actually are um, generally the vaccine rollout we've, it's been very safe and the reaction to this particular uh, incident, the pause and so forth, I think has been very balanced except amongst those who are already inclined uh, to be against vaccination. So I believe that you know there are there is a subgroup of folk who simply uh, do not wish to and have said they do not wish to be vaccinated. And of course, that's unfortunate. It may well be if we are able to extend this into the lower age groups, we will see additional demand. And um, that might, as uh, Dr. Marx has said, that might bring their parents into or their relatives into, and that would be very helpful. But I do think one of the um, issues is that uh, there is a group in the United States who uh, are opposed to uh, vaccines and this vaccine in particular, Peter. You might be muted. Sorry, my mute button didn't want to come off there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I, th I think you've hit it, Dr. Woodcock. I think um, we are getting to a place where I think we'll probably, this next tranche of individuals 
may take some more time and may, it may require us to go through more um, demystifying the vaccines and debunking myths. There are all sorts of, I, I don't know why people do this, but there are all sorts of myths circulating around in certain communities. I did a right. webinar the other evening uh, with a particular community and it was, it was circulating that these mRNA vaccines is genetic material and it gets into your DNA and stays there forever. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's having to be patient with that, not saying, not getting excited and saying, oh, you, you know, that's a bunch of pokem, right. but by ba basically saying, well, no, let me explain to you why that's definitely not the case. And you have to take them through understanding that messenger RNA is just a, it's, it's, it's a very labile, it's something that's just there transiently to get the, the genetic material in your, from your DNA to translate that into the proteins of our body. And that there's a one way valve yeah. uh, that does not let it uh, <laughs> go backwards. So yeah. you're not going backwards here. And actually when you speak about it, sometimes I don't know that I, I convinced everyone in this, right. but suddenly I got some nice feedback. People emailed me, wow, now I understand it. So I think some of this is that for those who do not have a high level of science education, it's very easy for them uh, to be uh, led astray by some of these myths. So we will just have to keep combating those mm -hmm. myths and, and, uh, and, and getting people, there are some people who I acknowledge will never take these vaccines, but I, I would suspect there's another 20 or 30% of I people agree. who are hesitant, but who can be brought over by just being patient and, and right. answering their, their concerns. Great. The next question we have is from Debbie Holt from the state of Indiana. Debbie asks if there are any predictions on when we might see a full approval for Pfizer and Moderna she says some public universities, hospitals, and others are hesitant to mandate vaccines as the EUA is still in place. And what is the process for moving forward with full approval of those vaccines? Uh, let me take that one. You know, the um, companies have to submit an application uh, for any, um, if they want to get an, a license, in this case, for a biological product, and then the FDA has to review it. We can't talk about any specific one or time frames because that has commercial confidential um, implications. But of course, in the middle of this pandemic, we're going to do everything we can to move expeditiously should we receive an application. And often the companies will announce when they have submitted an application. They're allowed to do that, but we're not allowed to talk about it. So it, it makes it a little mystifying, but we're working as fast as we can, both to um, keep up with the EUA work and any different modifications or extensions of populations and so forth, as well as uh, should we be reviewing any uh, applications, we would do it as fast as possible, consistent with making sure our standards are met. Great. The next question we have is from Mark Del Monte from the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, for Dr. Wilcock. Um, he says, Dr. Wilcock, thank you for mentioning the lower age groups. Can you share the current thinking about age de-escalation trials of Pfizer and the other products? Pediatricians can play a role to reassure patients and address myths and misconceptions even before children are eligible. Right, well, I certainly agree. I think because, um, because of the immunologic uh, nature of vaccines in general, and because of the, this disease in specific, okay, I think some caution is warranted in stepping down to the age, through the age groups, because, um, you know, we're seeing a different uh, syndrome of virus infection in the very young people than we do in the older people. So, I, but I, believe that's occurring with due course. And uh, um, it is desirable, I think, that pediatricians, you're another group who can reach the parents, you know, begin to talk to the, the parents and the, and the uh, children about the possibility of getting vaccinated and allay their uh, concerns before uh, they're, they might become eligible so that we have a population that's ready to get vaccinated when their uh, turn would come. 
Dr. Marks, do you have more comments on this scheme? No, no, I think you covered it wonderfully. Great. Um, one more question on the manufacturing of the vaccine. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the way forward in manufacturing this vaccine, given um, what we're hearing in the news about the former manufacturer and um, how we're ensuring the vaccine that is on the market is safe? Well, just to make one thing clear, the vaccine that uh, the Janssen vaccine that Americans have received so far was not manufactured in this facility. The FDA has not cleared this facility yet. That's public, so we can say for um, um, using vaccine in the in the EUA. And we, um, uh, of course, would not do that until we felt that everything, both the products that were manufactured there and the facility itself, met our standards. Dr. Marks. Yeah, I, I would go just farther to say that. Um... Uh, what everything that Dr. Woodcock just said was correct. And our, our folks take the quality of these vaccines incredibly seriously. Mm -hmm. um, they essentially treat these as if uh, they're not going to let this facility or any facility produce vaccine unless they feel comfortable with any vaccine coming from that, vaccine, that facility going into their own arms. So yeah. I think that's really the way we will treat this. Um, uh, it may take a little time uh, to make sure that uh, these things are, are, uh, get, get, get done right, um, but we have to make sure they're right and uh, you have our commitment there. Great. The next question we have is from Kate Washburn from Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Kate asks, is there any specific guidance for pregnant and breastfeeding women re- the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and any indication that this is a potential risk factor for TTS after vaccination? So I, I can take that one because this actually came up at, uh, with uh, our CDC colleagues. There's no evidence that, that uh, being pregnant um, increases your risk of complications uh, for uh, the, if you receive the J&J uh, &J vaccine. And, this is a real uh, discussion point um, for women with their uh, provider uh, because the, there's the, the, the benefit of being vaccinated uh, against COVID-19 is very great in a pregnant woman uh, because the adverse outcomes with COVID-19 are pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So whether it's with one of the mRNA vaccines or the Janssen vaccine, um, it does not look like there's any increased risk above the risk we know in individuals between the ages of 18, 49 uh, to 49 uh, with uh, the Janssen vaccine. So I think it is, it's is—it's something uh, that for discussion uh, with one's healthcare uh, provider about you know, which vaccine is, is potentially for them or whether uh, the vaccine, uh, the Janssen vaccine in the, in the right setting uh, may be the right one because you do get after one dose um, uh, the, within 14 days, a, a reasonably good immune response uh, uh, with one dose. Great. I am not, oh, there's one last one here from Elaine. Oh, um, are the vaccine manufacturers planning to request full FDA approval for their COVID-19 vaccines as opposed to continuing under an EUA? Full approval would, I believe, assist with building vaccine confidence. Right, so I can an an answer that one because it's actually already in our guidance. Um, so our guidance basically told anyone who came in for an emergency use authorization for a COVID-19 vaccine that they should expect uh, to submit a biologics license application at the earliest practical time, which is usually after they have about six months of safety follow-up on their population. Uh, and that's what we see the uh, manufacturers mobilizing to do. We agree completely that with, the, with uh, the person who asked that question that having a biologics license will help increase confidence in yes. uh, vaccines. And it also has some legal implications as well, potentially. So um, we will move as quickly as we can uh, to make sure that once we get those applications, uh, we uh, get through them towards a license. One more question from Jen Pollock from Zero Hour Health. She asks, 
We are hearing lots of false theories about pregnancy, fertility, and shedding of proteins, virus, and vaccines. Many are making connections between the increased risk for TTS for women using oral contraceptives with the J&J vaccine. Any advice for disputing these false claims? Um, I'll, I'll start here. Th these are false claims and they're more anti-vaccination type stuff. Um, there's no evidence that high estrogen states are, are, what's, are what's leading to this. Um, it, what, what's more likely um, the reason why we're seeing more of this in women is because women tend to have more autoimmune uh, disease. Now, Dr. Dr. Woodcock is a rheumatologist and she, I'm going to throw it over to her to vouch for that, um, but that's probably what's going on here. Um, additionally, these vaccines, uh, the mRNA vaccines, are, do not have any effect on fertility, nor does the Janssen vaccine. And uh, both of the mRNA vaccines, for instance, have been studied um, in reproductive toxicology studies um, and are, have absolutely clean findings. So I think we feel confident um, seeing these vaccines used in pregnant women. Um, uh, and uh, for lactating women, uh, we've, uh, you know, there it's, a, it's a, a matter of discussing with an OBGYN whether it makes sense to uh, pump breast milk for the cup to use the couple days after uh, you get vaccinated and then go back to breastfeeding because these vaccine, these not neither of these are shed, uh, neither the mRNA vaccines nor the uh, these uh, the Janssen uh, vaccine. They're not shed. They're not a live. Neither of these are live like live virus vaccines. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with what Peter said earlier. We just have to. Um, uh, reiterate, reiterate, reiterate about this. Yes, we. Uh, I see the question about change in menstrual cycles. We just have to reiterate the facts. And in fact, um, uh, CDC has published on results in pregnancy and you can cite those data that are available. So I think um, there, there's going to be an endless stream of claims that we're going to have to just patiently refute and and, and calm people down. Yeah, and also there was a question about that change in menstrual cycle and whether or not there's any data on that at all. Do you know, Dr. Wilcox? I think I, Dr. Marx had to jump off for one minute, so. Right, I do yeah. not know what the data are, but what I'm saying is there's just, we are looking at every single thing that's possible. These vaccines have, undergone their reproductive toxicity studies in animals and when no impact was found on fertility, on the offspring and so forth and so on. CDC has looked at pregnant women and has published on that. So there does not seem to be impact on the reproductive system, but specifically on menstrual cycles, I know that's the latest um, things circulating around and people are talking about. And I don't have any data on that, but again, they're going to be um, rumors after rumors that, that we're going to have to refute. And we'll try to see what data we can get on um, the menstrual cycle. Great. Um, there's a question um, about whether or not we have any update on guidance for co-administration with other vaccines. Have you seen anything on that, Dr. Woodcock? <laughs> I think it's a little early for that. You know, we have done... Um, that uh, getting a vaccine uh, mobilized in little over a year and into the arms of so many people is quite <laughs> quite an achievement. And looking at um, co-administration of various vaccines, I know people are interested. What are we going to do with influenza and blah blah blah? But you know those stu those studies would have to be done. I think at the moment most people are focusing on trying to get the population vaccinated. Agreed. Um, so I have one last question, and then I think we might be headed toward the end of our call. Um, just a reminder, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can type it into the chat function at the bottom of the screen. Um, given the vaccine hesitancy seen in, in, within minority and other at-risk populations, are there any efforts underway to work with CDC to develop messaging targeting these populations to ensure them that these vaccines are safe? You know, we know um, there were a lot of, of those uh, minority populations that were um, utilizing the J&J &J vaccine because of its easy access and just wondered um, if there's anything going on in that area. 
Yes, the CDC is mounting a very large effort to, for outreach. Um, so I think you'll be continuing to see information out of the CDC on, on those matters, including targeting communities that may be more concerned. Great. Um, Dr. Wilcock, I think that is our last question. I, I'm just gonna open it up to you to make any closing remarks that you'd like to make before we end the call. All right, well, it's always great to talk to the healthcare providers. You know, you are our sort of eyes and ears. We uh, work for you <laughs> and we hope that you're getting enough information from us, whatever we can provide. So uh, people should feel free to uh, tell us whatever else uh, that you might need and we'll try to make sure that it becomes available, but uh, really appreciate all that you're doing. And thank you very much. And thank you to all of our participants. As a reminder, we did record this call. We intend to post it on our, on our YouTube page within the next day or so, um, and we'll send you all a link to it so you can forward it to your colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks.